I would like to welcome our first speaker for today. He is none other than Dr. Helisus Getahun, Director of the Department of Global Coordination and Partnership on Antimicrobial Resistance at the World Health Organization. He is also the Director of Joint Tripartite, comprising Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, World Organization for Animal Health, and the WHO Secretariat on AMR that coordinates the joint work of the organizations across the One Health spectrum. Earlier, Dr. Getahun was director of the Secretariat of the UN Interagency Coordination Group on Antimicrobial Resistance that was established by the UN Secretary General and released a groundbreaking report on how to respond to the global antimicrobial resistance. Over to you, Dr. Getahun. Thank you very much, uh, Shoba, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good, good evening, good morning, and wherever you are. And I don't know whether I can share my slides. Um, yes, yes, you can use the share slide option, uh, and you can share that. You have the share slide option, sir, on. Yes. Can you see my slides? Yes, 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 we can. Okay, good. So thank you very much. I think what I'm going to, can you see now the slide? Yes, or, yes, or? yes. Okay, yes. good. So what I'm going to give you is a quick uh, update. Uh, first of all, I think thank you very much for your interest. And this is a uh, preparation uh, for uh, your uh, reporting role uh, when we embark uh, into the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week uh, as of this uh, uh, Thursday. And this is a very unique and good opportunity to bring you know, this complex issue into the limelight. And uh, you're reporting wherever you are into your national uh, media. I will be extremely helpful. And I'm so happy uh, that... Uh, uh, this media forum is organized to make you prepare. And my presentation will really try to give you the broader uh, political context and drivers. And one thing uh, which I would like to start is antimicrobial resistance is actually a natural phenomenon. Uh, when the microbes, be it bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasites, they always try to thrive and change um, uh, over time so that they will not anymore uh, respond to the treatment. And this in turn can cause uh, spread of infection, spread of uh, disease, as well as death. And we know ever since Alexander Fleming invented penicillin, you know, the first antibiotic, uh, we know that uh, resistance development has been an inherent uh, part of the uh, action of these uh, uh, drugs. And just to make sure that we are all clear, antimicrobials, you know, it's a range of drugs that can uh, affect uh, uh, bacteria, viruses, fungus, and also parasites like malaria. Why is the antimicrobial resistance complex? This is because we share, humans share antimicrobials, antibiotics with humans, animals, and plants. And of course, there are certain drugs that can only be used in animals, uh, but most drugs are used commonly across humans, animals, and even plants. Plants are also sprayed with antibiotics, antifungal, and sometimes also antiviral. So the drivers of antimicrobial resistance, as it is stipulated here, is actually where we see that infections are happening. So preventing infection with good water and sanitation and hygiene, be it in the clinical setting or be it in the veterinary setting or in the food producing you know, setting will be extremely important. This will help really to stop uh, the spread 
of infection and in turn also reduce the use of antimicrobials you know, to treat those infections. And in addition to that, there is quite a lot of uh, misuse, uh, which means unnecessary use uh, over and also overuse uh, in humans, in animals, and also in food uh, production. And this uh, also is a critical, uh, important uh, issue that we have to address through different mechanisms, including regulation, and also by re enhancing the robustness of the systems, be it the human health system or the veterinary health system in order to make sure that these antibiotics, these antimicrobials are prescribed based on the need and based also on the oversight of a trained professional. So I think this is critically important. And we also have you know, discharges coming from manufacturing of these antimicrobials, these antibiotics that goes into the environment. And although the evidence is still building, are also a concern that it may lead into drug resistance. The human health impact, when we look at it, one thing which I would like to tell you is that there is no global figure at this point in time that actually captures the overall burden of uh, drug resistance in, in, in humans. We have the famous 700,000 annual death, which was reported first by the O'Neill report in 2015. But that report is only focusing on uh, six pathogens, including malaria and HIV, which as you know, which are not bacteria. Yeah, we, but we also know there are at least 23 bacteria infections that cause illness and drug resistance in humans that needs to be accounted into this. So this 700,000 uh, figure is a very, very, very uh, substantially uh, underestimation because it only focuses on four bacteria, including uh, tuberculosis. So, but the good news is that uh, we are waiting a release of uh, robust global you know, data that actually uh, shows the exact burden of antibacterial resistance uh, among, you know, in, in the human, uh, which will be released anytime. That really helps to address uh, this major, major gap. The other human-animal interface, and as I said, the animals use antibiotics, antimicrobials, and there is increased, as you can see this uh, on this map, you know, the um, deep red shows the highest uh, percentage of resistance among animals. Uh, it's a global figure that was published, which really is significantly high. And you are, as you can see in chicken and in pig and in cattle, more than 50% of resistance of common antibiotics was, was reported. And this is a, a extremely uh, concerning uh, problem because there is also evidence that this drug resistance infections that are generated in the animals can also be transmitted to humans and can cause human illnesses as well as deaths. The other issue with antimicrobial resistance, which is still not a robust data, which we are working to improve is its economic impact because antimicrobials are used to enhance food security, food safety, and also trade. So this brings a necessary uh, uh, attention of the economic interest to come into the administration and the management of the, be it the animal health or uh, the human health aspect of it. But we have figure from World Bank that it has substantial impact, uh, which is futuristic. But currently we are working how we can actually more, uh, develop this on annual, really showing what is the current impact on it. As I said, the or also an environmental due to the manufacturing as well as also through discharge because 
animals and humans use antimicrobials and uh, after they consume them, they use them, they are also discharged into the environment, into the uh, you know, different settings. So that actually, uh, be it in the health sector or in the food processing, is also a challenge that needs to be addressed. Tourism is because it's a journey, you know, sometimes you can see some uh, sensational reporting around drug resistance and the famous one was the one reported in you know, Pakistan some time ago about drug resistance, uh, you know, typhoid and dysentery, which really sometimes, and it is really uh, carrying the risk. And COVID also another challenge that brings the attention of uh, AMR, and uh, unfortunately, although WHO doesn't recommend the use of uh, antibiotics, especially for the mild and you know, moderate uh, without uh, evidence of bacterial infection, there is huge, huge use of antibiotics, which we don't know the impact at this point in time, but will be really of a concern. And especially those in hospitals are being uh, given antibiotics without the need that they have to use it. So this is a, an extremely uh, important point that we have to look and also really to take the lessons out of the COVID, how we can address and how we can you know, take the lessons in, in order to address uh, AMR, which some people are actually call it a silent pandemic, while others are uh, countering this silent pandemic and saying, no, it's actually an active volcano that is ongoing, which I tend to agree. So I think this is just to give you a general uh, uh, outlook, and I'm happy to hear uh, any questions and I will respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a very lucid overview of AMR and for touching on aspects which till now have been a little less understood. We now open for question and answers. Participants, please type in your questions in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to ask your question. We already have a few questions with us. There's a question from Muthoni Waveru, who's news anchor and health journalist at Capital FM, Kenya. Uh, she wants to know what are the latest milestones achieved in the development of antimicrobials for reducing communicable disease mortality, and for advancing cancer therapy, etc. And how is antimicrobial resistance thwarting these attempts? So, as I said, uh, antimicrobial resistance is a natural phenomenon. Drug, uh, the bacteria, the fungi, the virus, and the parasites, they always evolve and change over time to uh, enable them not to be attacked by the medicines. So the concern here, since it is the question refers to you know, cancer patients is because the cancer patients, since because of their treatment or because of their illness, they have uh, less immunity, which actually also makes them susceptible for infections, you know, be it drug susceptible infection or drug resistant uh, infection. And as you know, cancer treatment uh, is also very expensive uh, compared to treating a bacterial infection. So sometimes these patients may die because of the bacterial drug resistant infection, uh, which would have been easy to treat. But the challenge we faced here is that the pipeline for new antibiotics, uh, particularly uh, for the drug resistant infections uh, is a challenging pipeline. And also of course there are attempts, but we have faced a complicated you know, challenge because the private uh, pharma industry has been one after the other being exiting from the research and development of the antibiotic you know, pipeline in the last decade particularly. And this uh, in a way, and this is the, the reason being uh, these antibiotics are not profitable. Um, and this begs the question, 
how should we address? And there are several discussions, several mechanisms, how to address this major gap that will also, in, in order to enable the uh, development of new antibiotics, not only the development, but also the access, the access to everyone that needs them is uh, something that has been taken at a higher you know, political uh, level uh, that um, uh, we have to take and we have to advocate. And I believe, and this is my personal opinion, antibiotics should be public good and should be available for everyone and should be also taken care of by, by government. And uh, once we have that, you know, good pipeline to address uh, drug resistant bacterial infections and also ensuring their access will be extremely useful to address the challenge we faced, for example, like in cancer patients. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Ashok Ramsuru, a very senior journalist from who was who worked for several years with South Africa Broadcasting Corporation, SABC. And uh, Ashok wants to know that antimicrobial resistance poses major challenges around the world in the treatment of infectious diseases. We are in the 21st century. What hopes do you foresee to eradicate TB in the next generation? Okay. So uh, to eradicate TB, yes. um, I think the current global efforts around TB is not actually to eradicate it. I know there was uh, uh, an earlier uh, target set in the early 90s, which actually calls for eradicating TB uh, by 2050. But we know that uh, when the current uh, end, end TB strategy, you know, the intention is to end TB as a public health uh, uh, problem by 2030 as part of the sustainable development you know, goals. And that uh, over the last decade, we have seen quite uh, encouraging progress around uh, you know, achieving those goals and uh, treating more patients. Uh, but in the last year and a half or two years, the COVID pandemic has actually reversed it. And uh, for the first time, the uh, TB diseases have been reported uh, as increased because of this impact on COVID. And as you know, the TB uh, system globally has quite robust uh, data collection system, which is reliable uh, as it was really built over the last three decades. And uh, the fact that uh, we are able to see uh, because of the disruption of services, TB services by COVID, um, these figures have been high. So this is a big set, uh, setback that we have to look and we have to address, uh, which I think uh, will also affect just like any other health program, including, by the way, antimicrobial resistance, the impact of COVID in disrupting programs and also progress will be a key challenge. So I think we have to pause and we have to see uh, what we mean, you know, in our you know, set ambitions, how we can take forward. Thank okay. you. We have a question from Kalpana Acharya, who is Editor-in-Chief, Health TV Online from Nepal. Kalpana wants to know, how has COVID-19 brought more challenges to AMR? Or has it affected AMR in some ways? Yeah, I just tried to mention that in my earlier response. I think from programmatic aspects, there has been quite a lot of reports that uh, the disruption of services, the disruption of programs has uh, resulted in disruption of routine uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, activities that are run by you know, countries. And this was recently published based on a survey that was conducted among those focal points working in countries on antimicrobial resistance. And when we looked into also the individual you know, patient you know, perspective, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, because of the COVID, uh, despite, you know, COVID is a, a viral disease, 
we don't need to use antibiotics in viral disease unless we have evidence of the uh, bacterial infection. And then uh, we have a report. Uh, actually, there is a, a COVID clinical platform where we also collect data on the use of antibiotics. And I think there are uh, like 38 countries reporting on the routine basis of the use of antibiotics in COVID patients. And it's, uh, it's really, really uh, high. It's between 80 to 90% of the COVID patients are used, are being given antibiotics, including those who are not uh, needing. So this means that uh, I cannot quantify the impact now, but we have to really look all these uh, issues, what long-term, uh, medium-term, short-term impact they would have on the, our response to AMR. Thank you. We have two similar questions, so I'll take them up just one after the other uh, for your response. Oh, uh, they are from Mokatam Madhu Babu, a medical correspondent from Andhra Pradesh in India, and uh, a similar question from Ellis Tembe from Eswatini. Uh, both say that in many countries, including my country, like in India and Eswatini, antibiotics are sold over the, over as, as the over-the-counter drugs. Is it possible to strictly implement their sale as a prescription drug? Because the abuse of antibiotics is leading to more resistance. And can WHO help in this regard? That is one of the correspondents asking me. Yes, I think misuse, overuse, and over-the-counter sale of antibiotics is a big challenge. It's uh, oversell. Uh, over-the-counter sale is not only for humans, it's also for animals. So I think that is why we have to really look uh, how we are intending to address anti uh, uh, AMR in general and the use of antibiotics, you know, be it in humans and animals in a very comprehensive way. So the regulation and the national regulation of uh, the over-the-counter use of antibiotics is critical. And we are recommending antibiotics should only be used uh, uh, with prescription from a trained, you know, be it in the animal, in the veterinary services, also in the human, you know, services. They shouldn't be really over the counter. But as you all know, and even there are countries who ban the over, over the counter of antibiotics, you know, for humans and animals. But the whole problem and the whole challenge is how to enforce, you know, this regulation, how to enforce uh, these uh, national uh, rules. So I think that really requires uh, concerted efforts across sectors. And uh, this is one area which we are uh, fully uh, uh, working towards uh, with our partners uh, in uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, in the Organization of Animal Health, as well as also in the, you know, in the UN environment, because we have to see the legal framework, the regulation in, in the broader context. Um, it's not only uh, about the over-the-counter, but it's also about import. It's also about the quality of the drugs, because if the uh, drugs are not of good quality, they also lead into the development of drug resistance. So I think we have to look at it in a broader context. And yes, that is a big challenge. And that is one thing which we have to seriously address. Thank you. Now, uh, one, there are other questions, but one last question from you. Uh, uh, this is from Mensidini from Papua New Guinea. And uh, Mensidini says that testing for drug resistance in P PNG has been a major problem. TB drug resistant samples went to Australia for testing. Dr. Getahun, please give your advice on how to combat AMR in the Pacific nations. Can you repeat the question? I didn't, I missed the first part. Okay. Uh, it, is, it says that the testing for drug resistance, uh, particularly in TB, for TB, is a major problem in Papua New Guinea. And TB drug samples went to Australia for testing. Can you advise on how to combat AMR in the Pacific nations? Yeah, so I think, I mean, this question is more focused on TB. And yes, yes. Uh, 
um, yeah, TB diagnosis is actually much, much, much more advanced than other bacteria diagnosis because, of course, we started with microscope 100 years ago. And now we have a gene expert, which not only you know, diagnose uh, drug susceptible TB, but also drug resistant TB. And also further, we have several other diagnostic tools that could help for the specification uh, of um, uh, the, the resistance pattern. So capacity and uh, diagnostic capacity, local capacity is important and uh, especially the, the laboratory network uh, is also important that the quality that is being established at national level has to also have that quality check through the supranational laboratory systems and mechanisms. That will also help, but anything that is not focused also in enhancing local capacity, but really uh, exporting specimen uh, is not, uh, is not a good uh, mechanism. Uh, but when you come into bacteria, actually it's very difficult uh, diagnosis in bacterial infections. Uh, there are some uh, attempts, there are some uh, promising technologies coming up in the pipeline. But when you really compare it from a programmatic perspective, what is happening in TB and what is happening in uh, bacteria, is totally different. However, we have the, an opportunity, particularly to strengthen laboratories within the human health system. As you know, the Global Fund has supported you know, a health system approach where they also really help uh, the laboratory platform. It's not only for HIV, TB, malaria, but also for other you know, uh, diseases and, uh, and bacterial infections and in really ensuring bacterial uh, microbiology laboratories would be a, a good uh, way forward that we have to look how to strengthen. And the good news, uh, the Global Fund, I think last week, they have adopted their new strategy uh, from 2023, 2026, I think. And in that, AMR has been framed as part of the pandemic preparedness or the uh, pandemic response um, way has been identified as one key area. So we need to really advocate, we need to really look the opportunities, how we can advance this microbiology bacterial laboratory using the already existing system. Because Global Fund currently spent 1 billion a year for those cross-cutting health systems. So really having a bacterial diagnosis you know, like a liquid culture within that platform that is already established may only need a small additional cost. So we need to look into those existing upcoming opportunities, which we are all excited, by the way, uh, of this opportunity to work with the Global Fund for HIV TB malaria to address this neglected AMR. Uh, thank you very much. And before we move on to our next speaker, I would like to invite Mr. Thomas Joseph head of the antimicrobial resistance stewardship and awareness at WHO for his comments. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shobha. And uh, thanks very much, Dr. Getahun, for that excellent comprehensive presentation. Um, I think I just noticed that a few people came in late and because they came in late, maybe it's in important to just underline a few core messages that you know, we need to communicate quite simply to a vast audience. And the audience that we hope we will reach besides the general public includes, you know, all those who are prescribing medicines. So, you know, whether they are chemists or whether they are physicians, but also uh, the policymakers so that they also can understand the importance of this issue. And I think the core messages that, you know, those who came in late may want to engage with is that antimicrobial resistance is undermining a century of progress in medicine, that infections that were previously treatable and curable with our drugs are becoming incurable. Medicines are not working because of resistance. So even common infections are becoming risky and a problem. Surgeries are becoming risky. 
And the cause for all this can be found primarily in the behavior of human beings who are misusing, overusing antimicrobials. We talked about over-the-counter sales of antimicrobials. This should become unacceptable. We must ensure as a core message that when we are sick, that really we only take antimicrobials with medical advice and medical supervision. So thank you again. Uh, uh, my thanks again to Dr. Haile Yusuf for his presentation and to you, Shobha, for organizing this. Thank you very much.